Hello and thank you so much for joining us for the video series titled Teaching and Learning Evidence-Based Relationships Interviews with the Experts. This project is brought to you by the Society for the Advancement of Psychotherapy, APA Division 29, and is a companion project to the third edition of Psychotherapy Relationships That Work. The overall goal of the project is to translate relationship research to teaching and learning from the classroom context to clinical supervision. My name is Dr. Raina Markin, and today we are very fortunate to be joined by Dr. James Boswell, Associate Professor of Psychology at the University at Albany and Director of the Research Lab Psychotherapy and Behavior Change. He is also an Associate for the Center of Minority Health Disparities. The topic of today's discussion is how to translate research on promoting treatment credibility to teaching and supervision. Thanks for joining us, James. Of course. Oh, thank you for inviting me. I'm happy to be here. So I guess to start off, if you could just um, define how you operationalize treatment credibility, how, um, how you define it, and how you conceptualize treat, um, treatment credibility as a therapeutic relationship variable. Mm -hmm. Sure. Um, so credibility has an interesting history because it's often lumped in with other factors mm -hmm. Uh, that are similar, things like preferences and expectancies, mm -hmm. and you know, even at this point, the gold standard measure, uh, the credibility expectancy questionnaire measures both expectancies and credibility. Um, uh, and although these factors tend to be correlated, they, they do appear to be unique, at least in the way that we're measuring them. Um, and in credibility, there is a lot to unpack still, and I'm sure we'll come back to this in the conversation, that just defining the construct itself is, is something that's, that's important for future work. And so when we think about credibility broadly, uh, we're, we're, we're thinking about the client's perception of uh, the logicalness, the suitability, the efficaciousness of, of a treatment or therapist. And so we'll also probably come back to how these things kind of get lumped together where you have this difference between therapist perceived therapist credibility on the part of the client and the perceived, uh, the perceived treatment credibility and so when it comes to the therapist it's about sort of the suitability and the effectiveness of this particular therapist versus the treatment that they're offering and, and at least conceptually we can think about how these things are, are differentiated um, also the way that we approached it um, in the way that it's often sort of considered is, is, is a fact that it's important early on in treatment. So the importance of fostering um, credibility uh, in the first meeting, at the time of the initial appointment, when you're providing a rationale, et cetera, um, sort of capitalizing on perceptions of the treatment being credible, uh, particularly early on. And um, when I talk a little bit more about the results from the meta-analysis, so I'll say a little bit more about why it is important to focus on these constructs earlier on in the process because things get confounded otherwise. But, but, but for our purposes, you know, again, sort of defining credibility as, as how logical a treatment is or a therapist uh, appears to be, their suitability, and, and how effective this treatment appears to be. This is going to be helpful for me. Does this make sense? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So I guess given that, and can you summarize some of the main meta-analytic findings um, that you that 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 came about in this in this recent work. Of course. Um, so, to our knowledge, this was the first original meta analysis of the patient's uh, perceived credibility outcome association. Um, and again, we were focusing particularly on early treatment. Mm -hmm. uh, even though we recognize that the credibility, similar to expectancies, is, is malleable. You know, these things do potentially fluctuate over the course of the treatment. What might start off as, as being credible or perceived as credible may, you know, if things aren't working in, in, a, in a positive direction, may quickly start to be less credible. Um, but you run into the difficulty uh, of measuring these things uh, later on in treatment as it become confounded by sort of things like progress and initial severity and, and other factors, and so it can be really difficult to tease apart the specific relationship between credibility and outcome. Uh, is it better explained by other factors? And so this meta-analysis focused on early treatment. Okay. And the other thing that's important uh, to keep in mind is that the credibility literature you, know, you really, in some ways, have to dig into other literatures within social personality psychology and, and other areas to draw sort of inferences from uh, from, from what's what's known there. Um, is in, in that uh, it's it's important to um, uh, sort of think about uh, credibility as something that that the person is bringing into the treatment. 
uh, you know, maybe some general assumptions about things, but it really is starting at the point of, of the, the client learning something about the nature of the treatment. So we're also assuming that there's some initial rationale that's been delivered. So we really are talking about something that almost by definition has to happen within the first couple of sessions, uh, because otherwise it is sort of confounded with expectancies, which we kind of think of as something that the client is more likely to come into uh, a given treatment course with. Uh, and so there are all these factors that, that, that go into the importance of assessing credibility for early on, you know, at the point of, you know, what is credible? They have to learn something about the treatment. There has to be a bona fide treatment offered in order for the credibility rating to make sense. Okay. Uh, and so we ended up with focusing on clinical samples. There's a lot of work in analog samples. So of course we're focusing on clinical samples uh, with 24 independent samples that are meta-analysis, over 1,500 patients, it's relatively small. Uh, but we did find a small but statistically significant association between those early treatment patient perceptions of credibility and, and treatment outcome. Uh, it translated to a Cohen's D of 0.24. So it's a small effect, uh, but, but we believe it's, it, it is a valid indicator of this association, or at least as it exists in the current literature. Uh, we, we found significant heterogeneity in the results, but we didn't actually find any statistically significant moderators of that effect. Uh, so that's still pretty open. We, we're assuming that there are moderators there, but we just weren't able to detect them in this analysis. Uh, but we didn't find any issues related to publication bias. Um, uh, we're, we're relatively confident that this is a this is a small but 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 a robust uh, effect. And the way that um, treatment credibility was was assessed in these studies is uh, was it together in there the patient's perception of how uh, credible the treatment is and how credible the therapist is, or are those separated? I'm really glad that you raised that question because that's really important. So I mentioned at first that um, even though it might be difficult ultimately to disentangle the two, they, they, they are different types of credibility in terms of therapist versus treatment credibility. So, so a treatment might, might seem quite credible, but not sure that you're actually the person to, to deliver that or sort of the best fit for me. And that gets back to that suitability issue, which is part of credibility, but, but probably differentiable from, and they probably are slightly different things. Um, we could not find a, a therapist credibility study that met our inclusion criteria. And so all of the studies in our review were actually uh, treatment credibility findings. Mm -hmm. uh -huh. uh -huh. uh, and that, you know, I think it highlights the importance of doing more research in this area. Um, and, and again, I think it's important to note that it's not as if there are any studies on therapists' credibility or suitability. It's just that often they're conducted in, in analog samples or okay. it's unclear how they've measured things and they're sort of confusing, even within the same paper, they seem to be confusing the definition of credibility with something else like expectancy or preferences. And so we really wanted to make sure that we were rigorous in our selection process, that this study is clearly defining and focusing on, on credibility. And so, yeah, we, it, it's really difficult to draw any conclusions about therapist credibility because we've, we, we only had treatment credibility studies in our analysis. That, so thank you for asking that question. Yeah, no, it seems difficult to measure and to tease apart and important for future studies to measure them both in the same study. Absolutely, absolutely, um, and you know, and, and I, you know, I, I wonder personally, you know, um, that uh, uh, even though the questions are phrased in a way that really does, you know, they are focused on treatment credibility. It's the intention is to look at treatment credibility. Mm -hmm. How much of that really is, in some ways, driven by perceived therapist credibility as the patient is completing the measure? I mean, I think this is a universal issue with most of our self. Um, right. But uh, they do seem to be different, <laughs> uh, and, and even though we, didn't, we weren't able to say much about it directly in our, in our review or meta-analysis, I, I suspect that some of what's driving this association between uh, perceived treatment credibility and outcome, it has, it has something to do with the therapist. Yeah, yeah. Maybe a lot to do with the therapist. <laughs> yeah, and I mean, what, what, was, what I was thinking about as you were talking about sort of how you conceptualize and measure credibility was also how it relates to just, a, you know, agreement on the tasks and goals mm -hmm. of treatment. You know, like when I think of the first couple sessions with new patients, 
there's a sense of, you know, what are we going to do in here? And do I believe that that's going to help me reach my goal? But then I like thinking more relationally in the background, there's the unspoken or spoken question of, do I believe that you're the person? <laughs> are you, you know, are you credible to, to do this? You know, yes, it all seems it's related. Yeah, absolutely. And that's one of the implications that we've drawn, even though it is a bit, you know, bit more based on sort of good clinical skills and sort of conceptualization. Is that, you know, part of working with credibility in the treatment and actually having a discussion about it probably should involve disentangling the fit of the treatment, quote unquote, that's being offered versus us working together and me being the, the right person to work with you, you know, on, on your particular problem. That, that discussion probably needs to f uh, follow both of those lines. Yeah, yeah. No, it's interesting because I think certain patients come in and they want to know, they're more focused on the treatment. Like, what is yeah. the treatment you're giving me? And other patients come in and they're more focused on the relationship and they're mm -hmm. more focused in the beginning of, you know, are you the person that I want to do this with? Uh, right, absolutely. And, and I think that that's, you know, when, uh, when I'm working with supervisees and sort of yeah. thinking about these things, it's, you know, um, you know, it's important to keep in mind that, that even though it, it's useful to appeal to, um, you know, what you know about the model and what you know about the evidence and uh, you do have some expertise certainly to offer, uh, but, you know, for certain clients, really trying to appeal to that, to the research and sort of appeal to authority and I have all the answers, you know, really is going to be off-putting, you know, and, and there's a certain sense in which it's inauthentic if you're really trying to hang your hat exclusively on that. Um, and so it really does, I think, underline the importance of attending to the client's perceptions of credibility and that it's not a one-size-fits-all, uh, it's, not, it's not a static factor that... Um, what will be perceived as credible or credibility enhancing is going to depend on the individual client. Yeah. Uh, and, and my hunch is that when trainees run into trouble, it probably has more to do with them really trying to appeal as much to the evidence as possible, um, you know, to, to be sort of more confident in their expertise and what they can offer. And so I think clients might focus more on treatments. I also think early on in training, trainees often when they cling to the treatment evidence base and sort of maybe forget about the relational piece. Uh, I think it's a great point. So I guess like taking that further, I mean, given these findings that there is this small but significant association between treatment credibility and outcome, I mean, what, how do you sort of apply that to training graduate students in the classroom or supervision, like you said, in terms of, you know, helping students to promote treatment credibility in a way that's helpful to the patient? Sure. Um, well, I think drawing sort of more concretely on our uh, review, um, you know, I, I, I do think it's important to think about credibility as, as dynamic, yet it, it really is important to establish credibility at the first meeting with a, with a new client. Because it, it's likely, even though there, like I said, there's not a lot of evidence, but um, you know, it, it is likely to predict not just outcome, which our review actually shows, but it also is likely to predict retention. Hmm. Um, and so we want the client to come back. And so we actually talk quite a bit about the importance of credibility early on. And some of that has to do with um, you know, really practicing delivering a rationale that uh, is based on solid, uh, solid theoretical background and, and solid evidence and, and practicing delivering that rationale in role, role plays and in supervision um, so that the trainee feels more comfortable um, uh, with that, and, and so that it isn't so scripted. Because I, I think you can have a good pitch, but if you sound like you're selling cars, that's a problem. You know? And so it has to be a rationale that you believe in, uh, because theoretically it's coherent and, 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 and logical, and you know that there's some evidence to support it, and so you sort of feel grounded in what you're offering the, 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 the client. Uh, but as you were saying before, it's so early on in the process, you want to be able to deliver, and I would sort of think about this as a sort of a generic psychotherapy rationale for clients, and as well as maybe whatever your preferred model is, if you think 
sort of going into it based on the information that you have that it might be a good fit for that particular client, sort of more of a model specific rationale, you're still offering that in a way that's tentative. Um, because you don't have all the answers, you're just getting to know the client, you know, and so and so I do think it can be difficult to uh, balance those two things. Is that is that I, I think I already have starting to get a good sense of who you are and kind of what the nature of your difficulties and how this might be helpful. At the same time, you know, I don't have all the answers, and there's a lot that I need to know, and we need to start start to develop a relationship and understanding between one another. Um, and so we focus a lot on, on building a rationale that's, that's credible and collaboratively derived, but also at the same time being very careful about um, uh, or sort of guarding against playing too much of the I'm the expert, appealing to the evidence at the cost of missing sort of the relational piece and reading sort of any nonverbal or other indicators from the client that, yeah, this all sounds good, but I'm just not buying it. Mm -hmm. um, you know, even though our uh, meta-analysis focused on treatment credibility. Uh, I also think when it comes to trainees, not surprisingly, therapist credibility or their own perceptions of their credibility becomes very important because, um, you know, I can think about my own experience early on and still even you know, uh, now, you know, uh, that, you know, if you haven't seen a single client, you know, it can be really hard to go into your first session with a client um, and feel confident that you can be helpful to them and offer something to them. Uh, and so I think that there's, you know, it's really important to normalize that anxiety. You know, and I do a fair bit of self-disclosure about my own anxiety working with a new client. Um, and that's okay. <laughs> that, that, if, that as long as you're authentic, uh, and sort of draw on your own sort of basic interpersonal skills that we've been working on, um, that you will be just fine. <laughs> uh, and by the way, uh, the research shows that there really isn't much difference between you know, the patient's perception of credibility and alliance and, and even outcome in those circumstances between me seeing this new client and you seeing this new client. <laughs> So, so, so you're probably going to be just fine. Uh, and so I, I think there, there's a lot of anxiety management that happens with, with trainees when it comes to their own credibility. Um, in, in some ways, it becomes more important than treatment credibility, especially at the earlier stage of, of treatment. Yeah, no, I, I, I definitely find that as well in my own training of students. And I think sometimes there can be like a clinging to the treatment credibility you know, as sort of a, I don't know, defense against yes. you know, the, your own anxiety about whether I'm credible as a therapist. So it can kind of, you know, backfire a little, a little bit that way sometimes. Oh, it can. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. Yep. Yeah. yeah, I think when the credibility, is, as I was mentioning before, is you sort of have to draw on a lot of other literatures and even other psychotherapy research, sort of even the relationships that work text as a whole, I think having a good working understanding of the other related constructs, I think they all build into and interact with credibility quite nicely. And so, you know, how do you sort of um, facilitate or foster perceived credibility? I think you foster it by just having good basic clinical skills and, and empathy and attunement and, and being genuine. Um, I, I, I don't think there's anything more to it, frankly. Um, uh, especially early on, early on in therapy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I, I mean, I know the literature is relatively new in psychotherapy, but are there any readings or videos or websites that you suggest either to you know educators and psychotherapy trainers or to students to sort of learn how to promote credibility um, more? Well, I think that you know, sort of the classics. Um, like Jerome Frank's Persuasion and Healing, um, and some, some earlier work that's more in social psychology and sort of has really been more of a focus in, in counseling psychology over the years is, is things like strong social influence theory. Uh, Bill Hoyt's also done some work along those lines that's shown some support for that social influence theory. Um, Mike Constantino's done work that's, that's really tried to bridge social psychology with clinical psychology and looking at self-verification or self-confirmation theory, some of this, uh, the SWAN work, um, that, that I think is very relevant. At the very least, we're thinking about, well, credibility is complex, and, and, what, and, and if we sort of go into an interaction 
with this blanket assumption that you know there's a, there's a, it's a one size fits all, and if I appeal to being the expert and I'm positive and affirming that that's 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 going to appear credible and that's going to facilitate other positive process and that's not necessarily the case um you know the, the work in depression for example about who is a credible other or who is more trusting you know isn't always the person who's giving the, the individual the very positive feedback and in fact it's often the opposite you know and so you have to be very sensitive to those things so the it, i think it is important to look back at some of this well, it's not even because it's ongoing, you know, some of the more social personality research uh, can be very useful in this area. Um, I also think that just watching a lot of tape, mm -hmm. tape, what I call tape, now it's just recordings. Right, um, right, yes, I call it tape too. <laughs> and even the standard APA training videos too, to, to see how, um, and of course it's confounded a bit because these, these individuals are experts, but sort of watching these sessions and, and just having a discussion is, do you think that this is credible? What about this? What do you think is happening here? Do you think that the, the patient is buying what the therapist is selling here? And what do you think is contributing to that? Mm -hmm. um, they're delivering a rationale that is compelling. It's, it's logical. They're appealing to some of the evidence. And it also feels like they're very genuine. And they're also checking in with the client to see if that makes sense. And, and do they see things differently? And, I think that there are commonalities even across different models of therapy where if you look at sort of quote unquote masters in those APA training videos, you can actually learn a lot about how credibility is operating. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, over and above that, you know, as, as I mentioned before, I think just having a good working understanding of the relationship factors in, in a handbook such as this, yeah. they all build into and build on credibility in a way that's very, that, that's important. Um, uh, we have to, to be familiar with all of these things. Yeah, yeah, no, those sound like excellent suggestions. And I, I like the idea of having students watch different videos and kind of about seeing different ways of promoting treatment credibility or, or not, but yeah. just to see that from different perspectives and angles, you know. Absolutely. So are there any measures that you encourage you know, that you either bring into the classroom to use as a teaching tool uh, in terms of promoting treatment credibility or that you encourage um, students to bring into their sessions with clients? So we do talk about just the, the basic importance of uh, attending to credibility and talking about it with, with clients, mm -hmm. uh, uh, particularly early on in, in, in a therapy uh, but then also being mindful to sort of notice subtle and maybe not so subtle markers of, of, of waning in, in perceived credibility. Uh, but in terms of measures that we use uh, in, in our clinic and in my supervision group, we often use the credibility expectancy questionnaire. Um, uh, and it's, it's brief, which is good. And, and of course, as I mentioned, it has a few items related to expectancy, which we also use, but, but we have the several credibility items. Um, and we will often give that to new clients at the first, uh, at the end of the first session, and, and sort of track them for a couple of sessions after that to sort of get a get a sense of things. Um, and I do encourage supervisees to bring that into the supervision meetings so that we can discuss that and, and the meaning of those of those ratings, and, and um, you can sort of just look over the items themselves and sort of talk about those things. Um, I mean, the other important uh, piece of the meta analysis is that even though it wasn't the only measure, it was by far the most commonly used measure in any of the studies um, that we uh, actually reviewed, included in our, in our analysis, was the CEQ. Mm -hmm. um, and so it's uh, sort of at this point considered more or less the standard measure. Um, and because it's brief, um, uh, partly because it's brief, we use it in, in, in our group. And um, uh, you know, I, I think in the long term, uh, is there a lot of work that needs to be done in terms of measurement uh, related to credibility? I think certainly that's 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 needed. Uh, but for now, we're we're focusing pretty much on the CEQ and talking about how we, um, you know, incorporate that in and use that as feedback with clients. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And it's a it's a e relatively easy teaching tool because yes, it's absolutely, direct. yeah, yeah. And we start by going over the items before they've actually given it to a client to sort of talk through, you know, their meaning and scoring and, and yeah absolutely great great so what do you think is are some of the 
major obstacles or challenges that you know as, as educators as supervisors we have in teaching students how to promote treatment credibility and I guess what are your suggestions for how to deal with those challenges mm -hmm. so you know as I mentioned before and you you had mentioned too is I, I think that one because maybe there, there is some anxiety you know uh, related to one's perceptions of their own credibility especially early on as, as a trainee is that there may be um, uh, a tendency to uh, cling too closely onto sort of the, the treatment per se and, and appealing to the evidence and really trying to be the expert. And, and you know, to do a little bit of self-disclosure, um, you know, I can remember, you know, early on in my training, um, you know, I was given the feedback by one of my supervisors is that you, know, you um, there isn't enough of James in the room. <laughs> that 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 you're you know you're, it seems like it's really important for you to sort of be you know, be on task and you know sort of follow follow through in a very sort of expert professional way um, and and there's a part of your personality that's sort of missing that, that I think eventually as you gain more experience it'll be more natural and, and you know we talked about what's going on there <laughs> like what might actually be contributing to that. Uh, sort of interpersonal stance that's a little bit more um, sort of distant expert role sort of let's be professional in, in the room and and so I convey that story to my supervisees is that, is that you want to be able to appeal to the evidence you do have something to offer uh, there are times when that's very useful um, but you also want to be careful you know that that um, you know uh, that especially early on in the treatment process that there's a lot that you're that you're navigating uh, there are some clients for whom appealing to that evidence or authority is actually going to be very off-putting and again if it's not perceived as genuine then it you will undermine your credibility mm -hmm. um, and so we need to do it in a sensitive way and check in with, with, with patients um, now, I think that's one of the challenges is that you just remembering to discuss and attend to credibility because I think there's always the possibility that we might get some uh, an indication that, that we're not being perceived as credible or the treatment is not being perceived as credible, uh, which in some ways is actually good because now you have something that you can discuss. And I think it's really important to make that part of the, the therapy. And so I think if, if, if you've gone over the hump of attending to it and, and, and identifying it and marking it and, and, and opening up the possibility for discussing it, then again, I think it comes back to sort of helping uh, therapists similar to dealing with an alliance rupture, you know, sort of navigate that in a sensitive way um, and, and rather than sort of dig your heels in, um, sort of open up and have a discussion about how you might be contributing to sort of uh, the perception of the treatment of the therapist, uh, what is working, what isn't working, and be willing to be flexible, you know, by sort of capitalizing on those components of the treatment that seem very credible and maybe emphasizing less <laughs> the other components that are possible um, that are less credible. Um, I also, from my own experience, I don't think that this is, um, uh, it's certainly not specific to exposure therapy because I think that this is this is a broad issue. Uh, I don't want to go on too much of a tangent, but uh, because I do a lot of work in exposure and a lot of training in exposure, you know, I think that one area where this comes up often is is in dealing with negative affect, mm -hmm. and and so if 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 a therapist struggles with dealing with negative emotion. Um, even if it's based purely on subtle or nonverbal indicators, it can undermine the success of an exposure, for example, uh, due to <laughs> sort of the lack of perceived credibility. You're asking me to do this thing that's very difficult for me, for example, a contamination exposure, and you're somebody who's not willing to go along with them and sort of uh, role play or model the behavior for them. That really is going to undermine credibility. So I, I don't think that it necessarily means that you have to have your own personal therapy to deal with that. But I do think that it is a, it is a challenge um, that should probably be addressed in supervision and training to some, for, with some supervisees. Um, the sort of the ability to better tolerate and work with negative affect 
uh, regardless of the treatment model, but in particular with exposure, it can be, it can be important. Uh, and I know uh, Tony Rosenbier and other folks are really focusing on helping therapists build better emotion regulation um, sort of capacity uh, with their deliberate practice work. Um, so I think, you know, and that goes along with just, you know, good for you. You talked about credibility. You, you started that difficult discussion and then it's, okay, how do I, <laughs> how do I, how do I continue this in a, in a collaborative way, which again will require a certain degree of, of negative affect tolerance. So, um, uh, yeah, it's all very challenging. Yeah, no, I think that cuts across all ways of doing therapy is helping, you know, I mean, ourselves and our students tolerate uncomfortable emotion, which I think, ironically, part of it is exposure. Yeah, yeah absolutely. <laughs> like, you know, holding the negative emotion with the patient and realizing you can get through it and that it's okay. Mm -hmm. you know? Yeah, no, I think that's a, an important point. Yeah, because I mean, if you if we're at, if we're attending to it and we want to discuss it, we, we want to mark it, then we have to be prepared to talk about it if it's not going so well. <laughs> There's always the possibility that it's not going so well, yeah. um, and, and we also want to be, you know, very careful uh, to not attend to nonverbal indicators too, because. A client might sit across from you and say, "Yeah, this makes a lot of sense," but they're every other piece of information in the room would indicate that they're not on board. Um, right. <laughs> yes. So, I mean, I guess given all all of this, I mean, what do you think are some of the lessons that we should take away from you know your work, your colleagues' work in this area about promoting treatment credibility? Well, I, mean, I think the, it's a pretty basic lesson, I think, at this point, given the state of the literature, mm -hmm. is, that, is that early perceptions of, of treatment credibility, treatment specifically, um, you know, it seems to be important for outcome. It's, it's a small effect, but, but we think it's a reliable and valid effect. And so at the very least, what it highlights is the importance of um, attending to credibility with, with patients, mm -hmm. you know, and, and, and attending to it uh, both in terms of sort of clinical skill and being able to talk, assess these things and talk about credibility with, with patients, but then also be able to integrate known established measures of credibility, like I mentioned the CQ, and use those with clients, but then also integrate that into supervision with, with supervisees. Um, you know, beyond that, um, you know, there are individual studies that we, that we highlight in our, in our chapter and in, in, in our paper. Um, you know, looking at what behaviors tend, tend to be associated with, with uh, perceptions of credibility. Mm -hmm. you know, there's some research that shows that making eye contact and, and having a forward trunk lean and, and, and other things, uh, sort of more nonverbal indicators tend to be more, um, tend to foster uh, credibility. Uh, but often those studies are, are in analog samples and you find that um, you know, those behaviors tend to be highly correlated with other factors like the alliance and perceived empathy. And so sort of it might just be general nonverbal, you know, uh, behaviors that are that are just associated with with perceived trust and, and good process and engagement and things like that. So it is really difficult to pull out, you know, um, very precise. Yeah. You know, this is what you do to precisely foster or, or attend to credibility. So I think I think beyond just now you know we have you know, there there is support now <laughs> to show that this is this is important and relevant and should be attended to. Um, I, I think that's the biggest take home, even though it's a pretty basic one. Uh -huh, uh -huh. So where do you think that we need to go from here? I mean, in terms of the research, but also just in terms of what we need to do in our training programs. <laughs> well. Um, you know, in terms of the research, I, I do think that there's quite a bit of you know, uh, conceptual work that needs to be done. So I guess it's sort of it's more in the area of, of assessment <laughs> and, and sort of what, how to make sense of some of these findings. You know, is that we were mentioning before this difference between therapist and treatment credibility that that they they can be teased apart conceptually, but but when we're assessing treatment credibility, are we in part 
sort of also assessing therapist credibility. Is there a way to actually disentangle those, those things? Mm -hmm. um, and, and is there a way to disentangle empirically uh, things like suitability from this broader credibility construct? Mm -hmm. um, so I, I, there's just a, a lot of basic sort of measurement and conceptual work that I think needs to be done um, in, in the area of credibility. Um, you know, I think it's also, you know, similar to what's been done more recently with the alliance literature, sort of looking at things longitudinally um, uh, and, and, and doing so in a way that helps you uh, sort of test more rigorous models and control for other variables. Um, so you sort of address this assumption that these things are epiphenomenal. Uh, I mean, the same work needs to be done in credibility, uh, assuming that it's not static. Um, uh, even though our review focused on early treatment, it, it certainly is important to look at these things over the, over the course of the given therapy uh, and in conjunction with other, other variables. Um, the other place where, and this probably isn't unique um, uh, to credibility, uh, where, where really there's been a paucity of work is, is sort of looking at how cultural issues factor into perceptions of credibility. Um, most of the samples that we included in our, in our review were, were predominantly white. Um, and uh, Jesse Owen is doing some really interesting work looking at things like cultural comfort and humility. And you can very easily see how sort of perceptions of discomfort <laughs> and lack of humility um, would be problematic for sort of perceptions of credibility. Um, and, and this is regardless of sort of the mass or mismatch, uh, match or mismatch between the client and the therapist in terms of their racial or ethnic or religious identity. Um, that I think this area of work and training would be um, uh, sort of moved along uh, I guess more positively and rapidly if, if, it, if it sort of joins forces with some of the emerging work when it, uh, it relates to cultural competence and cultural comfort. Um, uh, and like most of the work we do, sort of doing these trainings, conducting this research in more diverse samples um, because it really does require us, uh, that, that's required for us to, to really ask these more sophisticated questions. Mm -hmm. So I could probably talk for an hour about the other areas, but you know, I, I, I do think that there are just some very basic conceptual and measurement issues that need to be teased apart. Uh, more work in clinical samples that experimentally manipulate uh, credibility so that we can actually start to better understand the potential causal mechanisms because most of this work is correlational. And I think integrating this work with building on the other work in cultural competence and cultural comfort, um, I think that those are the, really the main areas that we need to focus on. Great, great. Thank you so much for, for joining us, for sharing your expertise. And I think this is going to be really helpful to supervisors, educators, students out there. So thank you so much. Well, thank you.